Hey, Summit Church, thank you for joining us for Who's Your One Evangelism Training. The very first thing you need to do, and this is only gonna take a second, is right now, literally right now. I want you to go to summitchurch.com slash one, and I want you to register that you're taking this training. You see, we're committing to praying for all of the ones that are represented at the Summit Church, and we want that to include your one. And so if you register, that's gonna help us, us do that to be able to pray for you and support you in this. So I want you to do it right now summitchurch.com slash one have you done it i'll tell you what I, i'm just gonna stand here and wait are you done okay well, i'll give you a few more seconds in fact could we just put on some fill out the the website music all right let's do this as I hope you've heard by now, this year, we are all asking ourselves one simple question, and that is, who's your one? Who is that one person that God is leading you to pray for, to, to try to build a relationship with, to share the gospel with, invite them to church, and, and Lord willing, see come to faith in Christ this year? You see, at the Summit Church, we believe that ordinary people are the tip of the gospel spear. We know that in our day, more and more people have to be reached outside of the church. And what that means is that the people who live and work outside the church, people like, like you, they're the ones who have to lead the way in engaging people with the gospel. When we study the book of Acts and, and, and really even the history of the early church when the gospel was expanding so quickly around the world, what we see is, is, is that it was ordinary people who were the ones that were carrying the gospel to new places faster than even the apostles could get there. So we know that God's plan A is to use ordinary people, not pastors or seminary trained people, ordinary people to advance the gospel mission. Now, most of us get that, we know that, but we may not know exactly how to get started with that. H how do we engage with our one? How do we build trust with them? Um, how do we not treat them like a project? How do, I, how do we start having a spiritual conversation with them without it being, well, incredibly awkward? You know, I've heard evangelism defined before as two nervous people talking to each other. And if the person believes the gospel, well, then what, what, what are you supposed to do next? In just a few minutes, you're going to hear answer to these questions and, and several others from several of our leaders here at the Summit Church, some of our, our, our ones who lead in reaching other people for Christ. These people all live out what they're going to teach you. They're going to be walking you through an acronym that we call FISH, F-I-S-H, the FISH strategy for evangelism. Now, you might be asking, why FISH? Well, it comes from the fact that Jesus taught his disciples in Matthew 4, 19, that if we follow him, he will make us fishers for people. If it was good enough for Jesus, then we thought it's good enough for the Summit Church. Each letter in this acronym is gonna direct you in the training. F stands for building friendships, friendships. I stands for initiate to the spiritual. S stands for share the gospel. H stands for help them make a decision. We think that if you move your way through this, it's kind of a map, then you'll find you know how to engage people with the gospel and how to begin to share the gospel with them and lead them all the way to the point of decision. Imagine the impact it would make in our community if every one of us was doing this with, with our ones this year. This one initiative could do more to create a movement of disciple-making disciples than anything else we have ever done here as a church. So get your pen and get your pad set up, open up your Evernote file if you're super cool and you wear skinny jeans and you got an iPad, whatever you got, you're gonna wanna write this stuff down. So here we go. What comes to your mind when you think about evangelism and evangelism training? My guess is that it's a gospel presentation. And while I think everybody needs to have uh, a method where they share the gospel that's really clear and they feel comfortable with, uh, in, in, in a way like when you're in that conversation, you know how to kind of move in and out of that conversation effectively. Uh, I think that when that's the starting point, we make, we make an assumption that's probably not true. Mm -hmm. And that assumption is uh, that people are seeking and interested in becoming a Christian. And I think that there are steps before that that we really need to look into today. Um, I think that we need a little bit of a new perspective. We need to kind of expand uh, our strategy a bit uh, to consider well, wh where, where are people in the process uh, of becoming a Christian? I mean, if, 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 if God is moving someone, if he's bringing to him, someone to himself, then there's going to be different stages uh, that they're going to go through uh, on that journey. 
Uh, and so uh, I have, I have a, a diagram that I want to share with you, to, you guys today. It, it's basically, uh, it's, it, it's a mountain and, and we're going to have different stages in that mountain that, 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 that someone goes through um, as they grow closer and closer to the Lord uh, and, and become more and more ready to, to, to give their life to him. Uh, and so the first stage that, that I think actually most people are in is they're in a suspicious stage. They're suspicious of the Bible and they're suspicious of Christians. In our day and age, uh, this is only growing. Uh, if you go, if you go into the Northeast, if you go to the Northwest, if you go to the college campuses here in Raleigh, Durham, uh, people do not trust the Bible uh, and they don't trust Christians. Uh, in fact, there was a Barna, uh, a Barna study that recently got released and someone said this about Christians, uh, that they're illogical, they're empire builders, they're prone to violence, they're people who cannot generally live peaceably with those who do not believe what they believe. If this is the reality of where non-Christians are, then starting with a gospel presentation and calling them to a decision only reinforces uh, their suspicion of us. What we need to do, there's an answer to this, I think, and it's building a real friendship with them. We need to care about them as an individual. We need to care about them as a person. We need to remember that they're made in the image of God. And we need to build that relationship uh, and, 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 and build it on trust. The way that you build your friendship with everybody else, you can do that with them. And as you begin to do that, what you'll see is you'll see the walls of suspicion come down a little bit. Uh, you'll see the walls of distrust come down a bit. As you share your life with them and they share their life with you, they're going to begin to see that some of the things that they thought weren't really true, that some of those things aren't, aren't accurate. And you get to be one of the ones that brings, brings that truth to them. And as, as you begin to do that, uh, one of the things that, that, that they'll, they'll actually move stages. If God is moving in their heart and you build a relationship with them, they'll move stages into the second stage, which is a curious stage. Uh, this is where they're going to be asking questions, uh, just like any good friendship. Like you ask questions uh, to your friends about their lives, right? right? Like if you tell me, like I know Riddell cares about cars. He's going to talk about that just in a minute. He cares about cars. So, so if I'm a good friend to him, and I see him pull up in, uh, in, in, in his Mustang, I'm gonna ask him about that, right? Uh, if I've got questions about what kind of uh, engine is in this car that I'm interested in, then I'm gonna go ask my friend about that because that's what friends do. Uh, when, you're, uh, when you have a friendship with a non-Christian, um, they're gonna ask you about some spiritual things and you can actually even initiate to that with them. Uh, and that's even one of the things I would say is uh, one of our answers to this stage is to initiate to the spiritual. It's to ask questions. When you read the Gospels, one of Jesus' primary methods of talking to people and engaging with them spiritually is by asking questions. In fact, he'll ask a question to a question. And then he'll ask another question to a question. He wasn't always trying to get people right in that moment to make a decision for Christ. He wanted them to get thinking. Because he knew that if he could get them thinking, if he could get their minds on the right things, and, and, and he would be there to share some of the truth, uh, that, 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 that we may see them move into the next stage. And the next stage is contemplating. It means contemplating life change. So the questions move from, well, about things that are out there to more about themselves. Mm -hmm. they're, going to be, they're going to be counting the cost just a little bit. They're going to be like, well, what does this mean for me? I hear you talking about, uh, I hear you talking about the Bible. Um, I hear you saying these things, but what does it mean for me? Well, I think, I think one of the best answers to the stage is to take them to the Bible. It's to actually open it up. Um, if, you've got, if you've got the hard copy, open up the hard copy. If you've got it on your phone, uh, you open it up on the phone. Uh, if, they're actually, if they're actually telling you things that are about their life, you can actually introduce what the Bible, how the Bible engages with yes. that. There's nothing that's going on in any of our lives that the Bible doesn't speak into. When people are hurting, I mean, the Bible has passages of people that are lamenting. God actually gives us passages to tell us, well, man, how should, we, how should we walk through that pain and that suffering? Where can we go with it? Uh, when, when, when people are, are confused about things, the Bible talks about asking him for wisdom, uh, sharing that story with them. This is, a great, this is a great stage to share your testimony. It's a great stage to tell them how God changed your life. Because God wasn't just a mere intellectual thing for us. God actually changed everything about us. And so that, that is how some of the biggest issues in our lives got overcome, was about becoming a believer. And since then, well, how has God changed us? Well, he's used his word, he used the people of God, uh, and he's used the gospel. Well, we can introduce that, in, into, that in, into, into their story, into our friendship with them. 
Uh, and, and through that, it, again, if God is moving in their life, what this will do is it, it could potentially help them move into the next stage, uh, which is seeking. Uh, now, the seeking stage is different than contemplating because in the seeking stage, they really are counting the cost. Th they aren't just like talking about sin. They aren't just like looking at sin. They are really applying that truth of the Bible to their life. Like, and this is a great stage to pull out the gospel presentation and not just share it with them, but call them to a decision. It's to say, hey, the Bible, the Bible is not just information about God. It, just, it doesn't just talk to you about like humanity. The Bible calls you to a decision. Are you going to come to know God? Are you going to believe this? Are you going to, are you going to come to trust God and put your hope in God? If people are seeking, uh, then, then, then they're, they're interested in that. They're going to want to know about that. And I would say one thing about this phase. This is a quick phase. Some of these other ones can take a long time, years even. But the seeking phase is usually pretty quick because they're going to be counting the cost. They're going to be seeing the depth of their own sin. They're going to be seeing that what Christ says is, I want your whole life. I don't want just a little bit. I want the whole thing. And so they're either going to say yes to that or they're going to run away from it. Now, look, I've seen people in every, I've seen people seeking go all the way back down to suspicious. They just make the decision. I don't want that. Uh, I've seen people in contemplating turn around and go back down. I've also seen people move through the seeking phase really quick. I've seen them go from, I've seen them go from contemplating to seeking to becoming a Christian in the matter of a few days. We don't know how the Lord works all the time. We just know that we want to be faithful to it. Yeah. And the last phase in this process is, is surrender. Um, like what, what, if, they're, if they're on a journey towards the Lord, then they're going to go from seeking to surrendering. They're going to see the depth and the depravity of their sin. They're going to see it doesn't just mess up things kind of in this life, that the, real, that the real problem is that their relationship with God is broken. But they'll also see the gospel. They'll also see Jesus on the cross for their sins. And they'll see that Jesus is saying, I want you to put your sin on me because I love you and I want you to come to know me. And so that's, those, are the five, those are the five stages uh, that someone takes on a journey to Christ. Uh, and so I want to tell you just a few quick things uh, about building friendships with non-Christians. I want to give you a few practical uh, a few practical tips as you kind of walk out of here, because uh, if they are suspicious and if they don't trust us, then we need to do everything we can to build a legitimate, real friendship with them that's built on, on respect and trust. Uh, but on a more like practical level, a couple of ways to make friends is one, cast, cast a wide net uh, and, and build friendships with many people. Um, don't just pick the one non-Christian you know, meet many. <laughs> Uh, you never really know uh, who, who it is that's interested. Uh, to give you kind of an example, my wife two years ago uh, joined like a workout group uh, and, and she found a lady that she really connected with. They got to be good friends. Uh, and there was a whole group of them, but there was one that she like was really pouring into. Well, we found out uh, that, that as she was like reaching out and st having spiritual conversations, sharing the gospel with them over the course of two years, it wasn't her one that came to Christ but another one of the other ladies that came to Christ. And you know, that's just how God works. She, she had the one that she was the closest friends with, but it was another one that came to Christ last July. So, so, so cast a wide net. Um, the second thing is, uh, have you, you guys have all seen like the, the green Lego boards, right? Right, and, and it's like, so, so some of us have a really big green Lego board. Like we, we have a, a massive capacity for relationships. Other people have a little bit smaller one. But no matter what, once that Lego board is full of Legos, you can't fit another Lego piece on, on that green piece. Well, that's the way we are with relationships. We all have a capacity. And once that capacity is full, there's no more room for relationships. I think we need to take the Great Commission seriously enough to where we have place on our Lego board in our lives for non-Christian relationships. And if we don't, then I think the command and the urgency of the Great Commission is such that we need to remove some other things from our plate, even if they're good in order to make room for non-Christians in our lives. It needs to be something that's there and it needs to be, it needs to be true for us. Um, you know, I think we need to, you need to plan to spend time with non-believers. You need to plan it. Like if you sit down at the beginning of the week and you plan your time, if you sit down at the beginning of your month, if you do that as a couple, like that needs to be a part of your discussion. What are we gonna do this week to reach out to non-believers? Uh, you need to build it into some of the rhythms that you have in your life. What nights do you have off? What nights do you want to, uh, to, to, to have people over and then consistently do it? 
Uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's weekly. We know that every single Thursday night, we're gonna have people over to our house. Uh, maybe it's uh, every single Wednesday after the gym. I mean, we're all gonna go to Whole Foods. We're gonna hang out. Uh, maybe it's every other Friday night. We're gonna have a fire pit and s'mores. Uh, whatever it is, build it into your life. Make it a part of your routine. Make it a part of your rhythm. You need to plan it. You need to be intentional with it. You need to do it on a really consistent basis. Um, another thing, you need to be the one that initiates. Non-Christians are not gonna typically initiate with you uh, about hanging out that much, and they're not gonna do it uh, about spiritual things. You need to take the initiative. You need to be the one that says, I care about you, and I wanna spend time with you, and I wanna pour, pour out to you. People respond. I mean, most people, they want friendships and you, you're gonna be one of the ones that's there uh, to do that for them. Um, remember, uh, remember what people tell you about their lives. Bring it up the next week. It says something, it, it says a lot to people when they tell you something about their lives and then you ask about it a week later or two weeks later. Um, it means something when they say, hey, my, kid was in, my kid's gonna be in a play uh, this weekend and then the next week you ask about it. It shows that you care about them. It shows that you were listening and paying attention. Um, especially if they share something that's meaningful to them. You want to bring that back up. Um, be patient with your one spiritual journey. It can, be, it can be a long journey. You need to be there for it. Um, on the other hand, don't hide that you're a Christian. Like you don't need to tell them the most important thing about your life six months into your friendship. You know, it's, it, should, it should come up kind of naturally. What are you doing this weekend? Well, I'm going to church. What are you doing this weekend? You know, hey, what do, what, what do you do on Tuesday night? Every Tuesday night, I'm in small group. My church does small groups and I love it and I'm a part of it. So be patient with your one spiritual journey, but don't hide the most important thing in your life. They need to know that that's true about you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, you're gonna have perceived setbacks. And I use that word perceived very intentionally. Like sometimes the people that you're reaching out to are gonna do things that disappoint you. Sometimes you're gonna be excited about having a conversation with them and they're gonna cancel on you 30 minutes ahead of time. That's okay. Sometimes life just gets in the way. Sometimes, especially if they're, if they're thinking about or they're contemplating life change, they're gonna be a little nervous to have that conversation. Don't bug out on them. That's one of the worst things you can do because what it says is all I care about you, all I care about is that you say yes to this one question I have about you instead of caring about you as a person. Remember Jesus was enormously patient. He was patient with the people that we see in the Bible. And my guess is with every single one of us, he was incredibly patient on, on when we came to Christ. For me, it took 20 years. That's patience. Um, and the last thing is be yourself. Don't try to be anybody else. God did not mess up when he made you. And he gave you, he gave you gifts and he gave you the Holy Spirit when you became a believer. And so he wants to use you and he wants to, he, wants to, he wants to work through you to make disciples, right? And in some way, if you say yes to this, if you say, God, uh, I, I'm here and I'm ready to be used, I promise you, he will use you in the Great Commission. He will use you to make disciples in some way. Uh, and the last thing I would just say again is pray. This is the work of the Lord. Uh, salvation belongs to the Lord and we wanna put that in his hands. Amen. That's so good. Um, and you were talking about prayer and I was thinking, I don't know who said that. I don't know whose quote it is, but he said, before you talk to people about God, to, to God about those people. That's and that's always been good to me. But in, in the same way that we depend on God to open the people's eyes to their need of, of Christ, it's something that's really uh, been great for Abby and I, my wife and I, is that we're constantly ask God to open our eyes yeah. to the needs around us. And I know that sounds very simple, mm -hmm. but there are so many needs around us when it comes to right. uh, building uh, friendships and that, that, we, that I just tend to pass by that I don't even see because I'm so concentrated on <laughs> my task, task and what I want to do. So when you start doing that, you start asking God to, to open your eyes to the needs around you, there you see it. You see your neighbors, you see, and let me tell you, I, I don't know if it's happened to you guys, but there's been plenty of times where I've actually apologized to, to a co-worker or to a neighbor, say, man, I'm like the worst guy ever. You know, like I, I've gone, I've seen this in your yard and, and I have the exact tool I can help you with and I haven't even lend you a hand with it. So I start very apologetically sometimes yeah. of, of my own neglect of them. 
Um, and then, of course, there are some practical things that have been very, very helpful for us. So one of the things we do is we invite people over uh, a lot, and we cook four to five nights a week. Mm -hmm. Yes, confessionally, it's because we don't want to, like it saves money from going out to eat. That's true. But when we cook four to five nights a week, we always end up doing a little bit more food than we need. And so what that allows us to do is it allows us to invite anybody. Like, anyway, any of you can come to my house tonight and you eat, <laughs> you know. So, and, and, and we always have uh, fresh leftovers, you know, that have not been there a week, you know. Uh, so... You can go to my house, and there's always food for you. And there's something about food, you know, maybe because I like food too much, but there's something about food that puts somebody's guard down, right? The other thing um, that we do is that we, this is very practical stuff, but we lend our cars out constantly. The car that you have, first of all, it's not yours, it belongs to the Lord, <laughs> you know. Uh, you have it by grace, and it's something you already have. It's something you're, you don't have to go get a car to lend a car. It's something you have. So we love, I'm, somebody's always driving my truck or somebody's always driving Abby's car. And there's always a neighbor in need or a friend in need that has a car in the shop or, or you know. And it's a really easy way to, to use something you have to bless somebody. Because again, it's, it's about blessing and meeting people's needs to gain their trust. Uh, another thing we do is we intentionally have a lot of sleeping arrangements in our house. Like we have a, uh, right now we have a mattress, twin mattress underneath uh, our other kid's bed. And we have like a sofa bed and all this stuff. And this is what happens a lot. This is to be able to have somebody over to sleep over. Mm -hmm. it, could be, it could be a sister that is in crisis out of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. We can have anybody over anytime. We have three, four people over and we have sleeping arrangements. And we've invested intentionally, you know, on this. And, but it could also be, it could also be, a single, a single guy that feels lonely and just needs family love, you know. Or it could also be, uh, so I, I befriended a non-believer uh, a while ago, and he, he had a, um, a situation where he, he was evicted from he, where he was at, and um, I was able to tell him to come to my house and live for a couple of months. And he was floored by that. He's like, I'm openly not Christian. You're a pastor, and you're telling me that I can go to your house and sleep for a couple of months until I find a place. I'm like, yeah. And so just having those sleeping arrangements ready, it just, it just really helps you to walk on people in, at any time with, oh, what are we going to do? We're going to put this guy, you know, get a mattress, you know, and, and if it's too much money to get a new one, uh, have Stanley Steamer come out and, and for 50 <laughs> bucks, they'll clean it with steam. So that's something practical uh, that we do. Something else that, 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 that I mean, I have found uh, just practical is it's doing what you already love, but with intention, intentionality. So one of the things that I love to do is kind of my, my hobby. It gets kind of my mind off of, uh, of the grind of work and so forth. Is I love to work in cars. And one of the things I do is I've noticed that teenagers in our church, from every campus really, teenagers struggle with money. You know? they, and so they're always trying to find ways to make their cars look good or, or to fix their cars, but they don't have money to take it to a shop. So Mondays is my day off. I say, hey, just come to my house. And I've had parents just like, man, thank you. Thank you for doing this for my kids. Um, and it's something that is not work for me because I love working on cars, but I'm doing it with somebody. And through that, we've seen like their friends come to, to, to our house. And now we've seen their friend on elevators or, or, you know, one of our student programs. So I would just say, absolutely, you know, just prayer. But pray not only for their eyes to be open, but pray for your eyes to be open <laughs> on great. how you can help them and not pass by a need and just do, do what you already do. It's just with a little bit of intentionality. Maybe cook a little more, you know? I remember Abby was afraid. She cooks great, but she's afraid of cooking for a lot of people. I'm like, babe, you know, let's cook together and let's just do it for maybe not a lot of people, but two more people, you know? Or eat a little, eat, eat a little less <laughs> and, and, and there'll be food left over. So that's just some, some real practical ways to, to really invite people, you know, over. And I love that. I, I love the... The way you, you think through, you know, building friendships mm -hmm. with people, especially through opening your home and, and being hospitable. And it makes me think about sometimes like the, the missed opportunities we have in building friendships, especially with other ethnicities. Mm. Um, you know, we know that God's word tells us that in the great commission that Jesus gave us, he said, go out into all nations, go out into all 
ethnos and yes. make disciples. But how can you make disciples uh, with people that aren't your friends first that you don't know? Like, for example, like everybody pull, pull out your phone really quick. Pull out your phone. <laughs> look at the Look at the last five to 10 text messages that you uh, that you sent uh, to someone that you would call a friend on there. How many of those people in there are people that that look like you? That of your same nationality. How many of those people that are in there are people that you would say, this is this looks like the diversity that the kingdom proclaims or, or it looks like my community. Mm -hmm. So just practically, you know, as you think through those things, those are probably areas that we can improve in. And don't, don't get me wrong. I, I get it. I know that this is it's tough. If the Apostle Peter struggled with this, mm -hmm. he's in Acts 10 and he's sleeping on top of a roof and still has not engaged people that don't look like him yet into the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit dealt with his heart and showed him, oh, wow, yes, this has been your plan all along that we would take this gospel and build friendships with people. Um, and in that chapter, you actually see that happen. You see the Holy Spirit draw some people to him, him open up his home to them, um, and eventually I'm um, able to share the gospel and able to build community together. So what I'm saying is this, we have to intentionally engage. Uh, we have to think through how we're gonna engage people in our neighborhoods, uh, in our jobs, and in different places um, as we're seeking out to build uh, friendships. Right. So, you know, um, and, and I think about it this way. I think about most of the people that I've discipled that don't look like me, that are from a different, totally different ethnic background, they were always my friends first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were always my friends first. Uh, we live in a very diverse area. The triangle is beautifully diverse with um, socioeconomic status for the type of education that people have, um, age. There's so many different you know, uh, ways that you can look at it, but I'm asking us to think intentionally about how we go about doing it. So, so how do you do it? How do you do it? One of the first things you need to do is you need to ask informed questions. Um, because we don't want to be we don't want to be offensive. A lot of times uh, we need to do a little bit of homework. Yes. Sometimes when you meet someone from a different nationality or a different place, do a little homework first. Find out as much as you can. So when you go to speak to them and you go to begin to ask questions, they can see that you genuinely want to know and that you genuinely care and that you've actually spent some time doing those things. Um, and uh, one of the things we talk about here at Summit Church is doing active listening. Now, I know that can be difficult for some of us. And, you know, I love to talk and I love to break things down to people. So I, I have to be an active listener, which means I'm listening to understand. I'm not listening to make a point. Yes. Uh, so oftentimes when you're building a friendship, it makes such a big difference if you do that very well. Um, uh, you know, there's other things that you can do. Find common ground. You'll be surprised mm -hmm. how much common ground that you can find with people. I mean, people, as Daniel was saying, that the brokenness that we have in our society, you know, there, there are people that are dealing with things in their marriages. There are people that are struggling to raise kids. And if you got teenagers, you can say, help me, Jesus, right now, <laughs> because I know, you know, um, for the, the variety of things that, that the people go through, whether they're single um, e even down to like e even movies. I'm like, you know, you'd be surprised that someone from a different ethnicity might be a movie buff just like you in the same area. They might love the Fast and the Furious. Uh, they might love Black Panther. I don't know. Uh, but one thing that we know is that they love food. I mean, you know, and, I, and, that, and that's why it was so good to hear that. Right. So um, and most of the times, Jesus, when he was building relationships, he was building it around tables with people. Um, and it's interesting, most of the time when he was accused of being around some people that looked like he would naturally be friends with, it was usually around the meal. Mm -hmm. So I just encourage you, you know, to, to, to find ways that, to do things that way. The last thing I'll tell you is this, uh, be ready to just simply step outside of your comfort zone. Yeah, right. One of the things right. we say here at Summit is that we need to learn how to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, we are a multi-ethnic church. Um, but our community is that way. So we want to learn how to engage people in that way. Um, I, I, I just encourage you. What, like, what does that mean? How does that look for some of you guys? You know, you know, and this is no slam on supercuts, but you might need to go to a barbershop. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you might not be used to going to a, you know, a barbershop. But I'm telling you, if you go and intentionally engage in that shop, you'll meet people. You'll get a chance to, to talk to people. You definitely will hear a lot of opinions uh, from people, <laughs> including your barber. But that's how you build those friendships. Um, you might want to go to a different grocery store. What if you got to drive two or three more miles mm -hmm. to go to a different place where you engage a different amount of people? We, again, our city is very diverse. There's a lot of people here in our city uh, and there are a lot of different types of grocery stores where you can just go to just to build friendships and to meet people. Um, um, you know, I mean, and ultimately, I think that you really have built a friendship 
if that group asks you to come to that family reunion. That's right. All right. <laughs> if they ask you to do that, then you know you are in, you know. And the reason why we want to do those things is because it's just something about when you spend time in their home, when you learn yes. what makes them cry, yes. when you learn what makes them laugh, when you learn like uh, the things that they value the most, that's when you begin to build a genuine friendship. And when people see that you care, when and they know that you care, that will set you up and build that relational right. equity that you were talking about. Right. That when it's time to initiate into a spiritual conversation and share the gospel and help them believe, mm -hmm. um, you have that there because you care and you build a, a great friendship with them. So now that we've crossed the barrier into building friendships, uh, we now want to take the next step um, in what we call the initiating to the spiritual and the fish model. Uh, now, in my opinion, I feel like this is probably one of the most awkward uh, things to do uh, is initiating a conversation into uh, the spiritual realm, spiritual conversations. Uh, so my hope for us today is that uh, I want to give just some three easy, three easy next steps uh, to just make this as simple uh, as possible. Uh, and it's not rocket science. Uh, I think a lot of times we want to try to oversimplify it or make this, you know, this, this big thing. Um, but really simple. And my hope is that we can take this put into the tool belt and continue to make uh, disciples the way that Jesus has called us to do. Um, so <clears throat> the very first thing, listen. Pretty easy, right? Listen. Now, a lot of times when we're engaging with people, we're, we're listening, but a lot of times in the back of our mind, we're like, all right, uh, when do I share the Jesus, right? Uh, we want to get to that. Uh, but before you even jump to that, just listen. Listen to what's going on in their lives. Uh, one way that I've heard it uh, said uh, is listen for, for the three knots, right? Uh, I'm not from around here, or things are not going well, or I'm not hungry. I'm just kidding. That's not the, that's not the third one. Um, but uh, I'm not from around here. Things aren't going well, um, and I was not expecting that. And a lot of times when you hear those, those knots there, it's, it's, it's showing that there's something going on in their hearts that you have an opportunity to, to grab onto, to, to speak into. But the deal before you can get to that, you have to listen for it. Um, you know, and as you're listening, it kind of moves on to the, to the second thing with that. Ask good questions, right? Why aren't things going well for you? What's, what's happening uh, in your life that you're, you're feeling this, this disappointment? Um, you know, the fact that you're not from around here. Do you have any friends? <laughs> do you have any things that you, that you like to do, right? You, you can ask good questions based off how they're responding, what they're saying in their, in their not statements. Uh, and that gives you an opportunity, like I said, to, to kind of jump onto it when things are not going well in their lives. Man, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Is it, is it cool if, if I pray for you about that? For, for me, that's, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, right? And uh, when I have things going on in my life, I pray. Um, and I would love to pray for you if that's okay with you, right? It's so a, a good transition into a, a spiritual conversation, right? And don't make this this long pharisaical prayer, <laughs> uh, but pray just enough to once, you know, in Jesus' name, amen. You have their attention now, right? Why, why, do, you, why do you pray, right? Now they're asking you questions, uh, and that gives you an opportunity to engage a little bit more uh, in, into the spiritual. So listen, ask good questions, uh, and then finally, know how to leverage your life. Know how to leverage your life. Uh, one way that I've heard it said was uh, intersection, not addition, right? There's something that you're already doing that you have an opportunity to, to invite people into. And then not only that, right, whether it be uh, some of the hobbies that you have, some things that you really enjoy doing, whether it be, you know, what you do on the weekend, right? Uh, for, for many of us who are Christians, we go to church on the weekend. That's a conversation to, to be had with somebody, right? As you, as you guys are interacting and they say, man, what are you, what are you doing on Saturday or, or Sunday? Well, I go to church with my family and my friends, the people who I go to the gym with. We know each other because we go to church together. Uh, that is an opportunity for you to, to leverage your life, right? It, again, it's just a, another way to intersect uh, that relationship into things that, that you're doing. Um, you know, you've already built a friendship with them. Invite them into the things that, that you're doing. Uh, you know, whether it be at your job as well, you know, uh, my wife, for example, <clears throat> you know, she does hair, right? And so as she has that person in the chair, uh, as she's cutting their hair, she's telling them the things that she really enjoys, the things that she, she loves doing. And she always somehow tries to intersect in there as she's a Christian too. She goes to church, uh, you know, things that her kids are learning as our kids are learning as well. 
Um, but what's so great about all of this is, you know, we're, we are moving from suspicion uh, into, you know, this, this curiosity. But we understand and know that in curiosity, uh, there's going to be a lot of other things that come up as well. Uh, some skepticisms and, and things like that that people may have. Um, and so, Eric, I would love for you, if you could, just to share a little bit about, you know, how do we, how do we speak into that? Yeah. I don't think it's a surprise for me to tell you that uh, Americans right now, they're a little bit skeptical of Christians and Christianity. So you're probably going to run into some times where you have intellectual objections that come up uh, in your evangelism. Right? I don't want you to be caught off guard by this. I want you to have a game plan when you go into this uh, so that you know what to do when these objections come along. First thing I want you to do, echoing what you were saying, active listening is so important. I mean, this is good advice for any relationship that you have, but particularly with evangelism, this allows you to just know where they're, they're, they're coming from, it, how they think, mm -hmm. um, what it is that makes them tick, um, and where it is that their objections are coming from. So that's going to open up so many avenues of conversation uh, so that you can keep the spiritual conversation going. Yeah. Second thing I want you to do is to have confidence, because you may not know the answer to the objection, but someone in the vast history of Christianity 2,000 years, 2 billion people, someone has answered their objection, okay? Another thing to do is think about who in your life uh, that you have relationships with you that you can invite into the conversation. Evangelism is great when it's done in groups. Um, and your friends might just have thought about these things before uh, a little bit more. I, I, I think I can speak for you too that the Summit staff, mm -hmm. the, the Summit Institute, we are very eager to help you. So yes. if there are, are ways that we can come alongside you, we're gonna be there, we're gonna do it. So you don't have to do this alone, you're not alone. Um, I also want you to think about just keeping the conversation going. So we talked about active listening, we talked about having confidence. Third thing I want you to do is when the bomb drops, when the objection comes, the one that you can't answer, the one that makes you think in a way that you've never thought before, it might embarrass you, it might throw you off your game, uh, it might be the first time that you've heard a particular objection. Don't run away, all right? Keep the conversation going. Uh, find other ways to engage them. Go bowling if you have to. I mean, just <laughs> something to keep everything rolling um, so that that doesn't throw you off your game um, and give you some time to go, go back and research your objection and, and, and come back to them uh, with something that's satisfying. The fourth thing I wanted to talk to you guys about is just realize that this might be a smoke screen. The, the objections they bring up, it just might be a smoke screen to something else that's, that's the problem. Um, realize that you're talking to a whole person and um, there might be some other reasons that are preventing them from coming to faith. You're not trying to win a debate, you're trying to invite somebody into God's family. From my experience, the intellectual objections are never the only reason that somebody doesn't, uh, walks away from Christianity. Um, they stop considering Christianity because they might not like the Bible's guidelines on finances or, or sexuality or personal freedom. Uh, these are some of the real reasons that they're, that they're walking away from faith. Almost everyone that I know that have stopped considering Christianity, it's been on those lines instead of intellectual objections. Uh, so just remember that this might be a smokescreen to something else deeper that's going on inside of the life of the person. Your job is to cut through that and speak directly to their soul. You may not have all the answers to their questions, and that's okay because that's not the ultimate goal. What you're trying to do at the end is invite them into a relationship with Christ. Let's talk about the S in the fish strategy, share the gospel. This is the essence of what we are referring to whenever we use the word evangelism. This is a really important step in this whole process, and I'm, I don't think I have to convince you of that because you're here. So I think you love Jesus, want to know how to share his gospel. So, um, but before we talk about how to actually share the gospel, it's important for us to set some expectations before entering into those conversations. And um, there's a, a, one thing to remember is that you are not alone in not knowing how to do this sometimes. And so some of the expectations that might be helpful for you is in, in preparation for this is number one, pray. Pray before you enter into these conversations. Ask your friends to pray for you before you enter into these conversations. Ask God to give you clear, persuasive, effective speech before you, before you enter into these. And pray during. 
You know, a lot of times when I am speaking, I'm praying that God would just make my words His, and but also pray while the person is talking, while you're actively listening to what they're sharing, praying that God would give you the words to say. Uh, but pray and obviously pray after. But one of the things that is really awesome in sharing the gospel is praying with the person. If they express a concern of some sort, ask them if you can pray for them right there and then insert the gospel into your prayer. It's like the world's easiest evangelism trick. Um, one of the things that we can do is also ask your friends to involve yourself, involve them in this process. Ask them to pray, obviously, but to follow up after. You know, ask you how it's going. Ask you how that conversation went. And do the same for your friends. Um, also, not viewing success, that you trust God's word more than your feelings. Your feelings can change, but God's word stays the same forever. And lastly, and importantly, see success is speaking. And Romans 10 tells us that we, that there's faith by what is heard. And so that implies that we are speaking. A lot of times we're, we're thinking so much about the salvation of the person that we forget that the, uh, that the command is to speak. The command is to share. And so um, just remember that while, and trust God that he's the one who saves. Um, and speaking of expectations, you should expect that a lot of these conversations will be awkward. And so it's really good if you just go into it knowing that. Um, here's the thing, awkwardness is a part of it. It is fear of man is a part of a lot of these conversations. And so it's often at the, what is at the root of ma what makes those situations kind of weird. And it's especially at the root when you're challenging somebody's worldview. Um, we often fear things like, am I going to sound judgy or am I going to, you know, I'm, I'm being, uh, I don't have all the answers. I don't want to be exclusive, right? We hear that all the time. I don't want to be exclusive. I don't want them not to like me. That's, I mean, it's a common fear that we have. And so here's the thing though, is that God, you were put on this planet to be a witness to the glory of God. And it's to share the good news of the gospel that changed you. So this is a personal thing that you're doing and sharing. And so we're called to be witnesses. We're called to show this glorious salvation to others. And so sometimes that means pushing past that awkward. I hate to say it like this, but sucking it up and taking a deep breath <coughs> and speaking. Speaking is a big part of this, okay? Speaking is going to, even when you don't know the answers, we're called to speak. Jeremiah 23, 29 tells us that, isn't my word like fire, declares the Lord, like a hammer that breaks the rock to pieces. That is what we're called to do when we speak. We speak the word of God. And God, and remember that, again, that our responsibility is to speak, but it's God's to save. So the question is, when you do speak, what do you say? Oftentimes when we share the gospel, we can get kind of fumbled up on our words and all these kind of different things. And there's lots of different ways to share the gospel, but today I want to teach you just a simple, clear way to explain it. We have to remember that the power of God is found in the gospel and not in our persuasive speech. And so we just want to make sure when we share the gospel with our friends, we're sharing it in a very clear and compelling way. And so when I share the gospel, I usually ask my friends, can I just um, show you one verse? And this verse pretty much explains the entire Bible. And this verse is found in Romans, and it's Romans 6.23, and it says this, it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So when we think about uh, the gospel, the gospel is uh, basically the good news of what Jesus has done for us. And the, the story starts off that all of us, uh, we were created to know God and God created us to know him and to be in relationship with him. But unfortunately, because of our sin, we've been separated from God. From God. And so now there's this basically this giant chasm between us and God. And so you can draw it out like this. We have, we're on one side, God is on the other, and we have this giant chasm in between us because of our sin. And if you look at this verse, each section has some pretty powerful words for us to know um, about why we're on this first side. So if you look at the first section, which says, for the wages of sin is death, there's three big words there. There's wages, sin, and death, right? And so the first word is a wage. So you can think about what is a wage. So when I was, uh, I used to work at Chick-fil-A and I was, you know, frying the, the fries back there and pushing chicken and all that kind of stuff. And when I did that, I got paid $8 an hour, right? That was my wage because that's what I earned for what I did. So a wage is just what you have earned. Sin is simply just disobedience to God. 
that God created us to know him and walk with him and to live in a certain way. And we sin when we, we disobey God. Now, when we think about sin, we usually think about our actions. So we know the Bible, like the Ten Commandments says, don't murder, right? Don't lie, don't steal, don't commit adultery. And it is our actions. But Jesus goes even further, says it's not just your actions, it's also your motivations, right? Mm -hmm. It's also what's going on in your heart. So it's not just committing adultery, but if you think lustfully after a man or lustfully after a woman, it's not just actually murder, murder it's not just killing somebody, but it's also just being angry um, in your heart towards a brother. And so the Bible is pretty clear that all of us have sinned. Even the very best of us have sinned against God. And it says wages, sin, and the last one is death. So we think about what is death. Death, what I like to describe is just separation from life. That if somebody is dead or, you know, if you hit a squirrel on the side of the road or whatever, it's just the life is gone, right? And so the question is, when God created us in the very beginning, in the very beginning, he was in the garden and he said to Adam, he said, hey, you can do everything you want in this garden. You can enjoy the garden, but the one thing you can't do is eat of this tree. And if you eat of this tree, you will surely die, mm -hmm. okay? And so then he goes, Adam goes over, actually, and Adam and Eve, and they eat of the tree, right? They eat the fruit of the tree. The, the, the thing is, though, that they're still breathing. Mm. So the question is, what did God mean when he said that they were going to die? Was, did they kind of call God's bluff, or was God a liar? What we actually see is because of that one sin, what happens is Adam and Eve get kicked out of the garden. Because of one sin, they get separated from God. So death is actually just separation from God because it's separation from life. And God is the life giver. All life flows from God. And so what this, verse is, what this is saying over here is because of our sin, what we have earned is separation from God. And all of us are separated from God because of our sin. Now that's the bad news. But there's some really good news coming later in this verse. The next section says, but the free gift of God is eternal life. So the three big words we see there are free gift, God, and eternal life. A free gift, so a gift is just something that someone gives you, and a free gift means somebody gave you this and you didn't do anything to earn it, right? So maybe the, you can think of your favorite gift you got as a kid. I remember one time my uh, parents got me and my older brother a trampoline, and it was like the greatest thing ever for, for Christmas, right? We just played on it all the time. Now, it wasn't that I was just a great kid that year. They just freely gave me that gift, right? So the free gift that God gives us, so we think the Creator loving God that He gives is eternal life. Eternal just means it lasts forever. Life, so we think if death meant separation from God, life means a connection with God or back in right relationship with God. And so what this verse is saying is the free gift that God is giving to us, the undeserving gift we had nothing to get, is to have eternal life with God, to be back in right relationship with God. But the question is, how do we get from this side of separated from God back in right relationship with God? And that's the very final part of the verse. It says we do that in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Mm -hmm. The bridge from us being separated from God to being connected with God is Jesus. See, what Jesus is, Jesus came and lived the perfect life. Unlike us, he obeyed God every single time and he lived the perfect life in our place. And then he went to the cross and died in our place. And then three days later, he rose again. So what happened on the cross is Jesus got treated like he lived our life as sinners and rebels against God. So now if we believe in him, we can get treated like we live Jesus's life as perfect, obedient sons and daughters. The good news of the gospel is Jesus has taken the death that you deserve. And so now you get the life that he deserves if you believe in him. But just like any gift, you must receive it. So imagine if I came up here and I put a giant briefcase in front of you. There's a million dollars here and I put it up in front of you. I said, hey, you can have this. I put it up there. I closed it. And then you looked at the briefcase and just walked away. You would have no more money when you walked out than when you came in because you never actually grabbed and received the briefcase. But if you grabbed it, you walked out with a million dollars. In the same way, Christ has died for each and every one of us. He has died for you and risen again. But you must receive that gift. You must receive the gift of eternal life. And the way you do that, the Bible says, is simply by repentance and belief. Mm -hmm. To repent just means you turn away from your sin. So when you're repenting, that means instead of living a sinful lifestyle, you turn away from that. And to believe means you trust, right? That means you trust that Jesus is who he says he is, that he is the son of God who has come, lived a perfect life in your place, died and rise again. And anyone who believes, repents of their sin and believes in Jesus gets to be with God. So the way you get from being separated with God to have eternal life with God is through Jesus and what he has done for us on the cross. In my experience of sharing the gospel, um, I've found that sharing my testimony uh, could be a very effective way uh, to lead other people to Christ. But, but I'll be real with you. Um, it's not always easy uh, to share a testimony um, in a way that's clear and concise and, and relatable uh, to non-Christians. Um, and so what I want to do for the next few minutes is just train you on how to share your story in a way that's quick and easy. 
Uh, first things first is that you need to understand what the purpose of a testimony is. Um, the purpose of a testimony is to make Jesus visible to the lost. Um, therefore, an effective testimony is a Jesus exalting personal story about how God changed you and is changing you. And I would recommend three steps that you use when engaging with someone in conversation about your step testimony. Step number one is to describe your life before Jesus. Step number two is to describe your encounter with Jesus. And step number three is to describe your life after Jesus. Um, and you can describe each of those steps using two to three adjectives or phrases. And so if I were to give you an example of what that looked like for me, if I were sharing my testimony, it would sound something like this. Step number one, before Christ, I was a very self-seeking person and I found my identity in sports and success. Step number two, but it wasn't until my roommate in college confronted me and said, Rich, Jesus didn't create you to live for yourself. He created you to know him and to live for him. And that living for yourself was a sin against God that only Jesus could save you from. Step number three, eventually I believed in the gospel. And when I believed in the gospel, my desires changed. I no longer desired to live a life for myself, but I desired to live a life for Jesus and to make him known to everybody who didn't know him. And see, my identity and success was no longer found in success in sports, but it was found in Jesus Christ because I had a new identity and that was more joyful to me than anything that this life can give. So that's it. In three easy steps, that's my short, succinct testimony. There's one more part to this process, and it's this. Asking the question, have you ever experienced something like this in your life? This is a great question to segue into further conversation. It will allow you the opportunity to hear a little bit more about their life experience, share the gospel, and transition into the next part of this evangelism training, which is to help them believe. All right, we've come to the final piece uh, of our strategy, right? And um, you guys have, we've been through this training where we have, we've learned, we've been walking through what it, what it looks like to build friendships with a non-believer with your one, uh, but then not only just how to, how to have a good friendship with them, but then begin the process of initiating into the spiritual conversation. Uh, and then, you know, we've been trained and equipped in, in walking through how to share the gospel. Uh, but for, for some reason, we like to stop right there. And, and, but there's one more piece of that, and it's the piece that we have been praying for, right? It's the, it's the piece that we've been asking God to do, and that is help our friend make a decision for the gospel, for Christ, right now, yeah. right? It's, it's, really easy, um, it's really easy to, um, to get to this point and to stop because we fear rejection. We've done all the hard work, right? We, we've gone through all of it right now. And, and now we get, we get to put the ball in their court and help them own their faith in this moment. In sports, if a, a coach draws up a play for you, the game's tied five seconds left in basketball, you steal the ball, you got a breakaway layup, the goal is right there, and you just decide, you know what? I'm gonna hold on to it. Let's just keep this thing going, right? You're like, man, you've come to this point, let's finish the play, finish the play, all right? And I think, um, in, in part of this, finishing the play and helping them believe, I think it's really, really simple. Um, I think it's just making the ask. Like, ask your friend a very, Simple question. Are you ready to believe the gospel for yourself? Because what we're trying to get at at this point is we're trying to take the gospel from, from something that they just mentally assent to, right? It's just something that they, they may believe up here or it's just knowledge or facts or something. And we're trying to, with a question, right? A question has power. It personalizes things. We're trying to take it and say, it's now up to you. It's your decision if you are going to believe this for yourself. You have to make the ask. Look them in the eye. It says, remember, this is the moment that you have been praying for and hoping for. So you get there, finish the play, make the ask. Are you ready to believe the gospel for yourself? Now, I've always heard that um, a good question is never really like a, a question that you can answer yes or no. But I, I think in this moment, a good question is an answer that they have to answer yes or no to. Right? They, they have got to make a decision in that moment where they personalize their faith. It can no longer be just you leading them. It can no longer be just the facts that are put out there. They've got to take ownership of it in that moment. So ask them that question, a yes or no question. 
And, and when they say yes, because that's what we're praying and believing, right? Is that they would believe the gospel. When they, when they say yes, what do you do now? Well, I think it's, I think it's, it's easy. I, I think you model for them what the next step is. Praying and believing and taking ownership of it. The action of ownership, right? Uh, so I think that, that's, that's pretty basic. It, it can be pretty simple. You don't have to overthink this. Um, don't make this too theologically, um, like too big to where it can't be grasped, but model a prayer of confession and belief for them. Uh, it, can, it can be the simple ABC, uh, you know, admit that I am a believer. That's Romans chapter three, right? That, that my sin is the separator, just what we just walked them through. Um, that they would come to a place of belief. You know, Acts 16 says that when they believe the gospel, right? Romans tells us that when they believe the gospel, salvation is theirs. And then that they would come to a place of confession, right? You would lead them through a prayer of confession, modeling it for them. Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner. I believe that you sent your son to die in my place. And I confess you, as Romans says, I confess you as Lord. And, uh, and in that moment, as you've modeled that for them, maybe you've walked them through that and they've repeated the prayer. Maybe your friend is ready to just pray that by themselves and you can just give them as a template. Um, your friend has just become a follower of Jesus Christ, right? And that is like the thing that we have been praying for. And so at this point, you should be jumping up and down excited about what just took place. Which is amazing and I hope happens all the time. It's what we want. Um, but sometimes they don't surrender their life to Christ. Sometimes they don't say yes, um, even after you ask them and their reaction is more like, no, no thanks, or not gonna happen. And it's what happened, like what do we do when that happens, right? Um, is also a piece of it. Uh, and so uh, before I give some like ideas and thoughts on how to keep going and not become discouraged and keep sharing your faith, I wanna let you know that this is where I'm at and like living this right now. Um, to the point where like a uh, story is my neighbor moves in um, almost three years ago and just get to know her and very quickly learn she's not a believer. Like it's just obvious she's not interested, um, but keep wanting, you know, realize like, hey, I want her. I feel like God moved her here for a reason and I want her to be my one. God, I want you to save her. And I've prayed that for three years now. This year, God, would it be this year? And it was like the spirit just used that as a moment for me to remind me of a couple things that I think would be really helpful if you're in that spot. Um, and the first one was, um, I'm called to love her. I'm called to love her. Uh, it's 1 John 4, 19. We love because he loved us. And so the gospel is that God loves us even when we push him away, even when we reject, even when we're not interested. Um, you know, he pursues us and he loves us and he wants to know us and have a relationship with us. And so I felt very, uh, the spirit be very clear on like, hey, Sheree, you are called to love her. And there are some ways that you can keep sharing me with her, um, even if it doesn't look like a like, let's pray the prayer right now conversation. And some of those ways have been um, continuing to invite her into my home and let her be around my family and see um, how we uh, try to uh, allow God to be a part of everything we do. Um, I waited for a long time for her to ask me, mm -hmm. like a really, really long time. Um, and I'm like, man, she just doesn't ask and would get very frustrated by that. And finally, it was kind of like, hey, why wait? You know, like she talks about herself and it's who she is and she's unashamed about it. Why can't I do the same? So I'm trying to learn to infuse just what God's doing in me, through me, around me, just into our conversation. So it's just undeniable and it's just there. Um, trying to pray for her on the spot. I've gotten to do this a couple of times um, and she's let me. So, hey, even if it, she says she doesn't believe in the God I'm talking to, she's let me pray for her when her parents' house got broken into and she was scared and when her job's on the line, you know? And so I'm trying to pray for her in the moment and I'm gonna continue to invite her to church and to um, Deepak and to our small group missional hangout. So far, she said no to everything but the missional hangout, but she's come a couple of times. Um, so I don't want to uh, forget that we are called to love regardless of what they do with the conversation. And then the second thing is that um, salvation belongs to God. It doesn't belong to me. And as much as I know that in my head, theologically, it, I got to the place where I was so discouraged that I was ready to give up. And what that tells me is that I've kind of made an idol of like, the decision has to be made, you know? And we're like, I'm in charge. I, like I can control her salvation and I just can't. And God just reminded me of that. He humbled me there. He said, Shri, that's my job. What I've called you to be faithful to do is to keep going, to keep sharing and to share the love of Christ so that hopefully one day we'll be at that moment. Amen. Um, so if your friend does come to Christ and submits their life to Jesus, um, I believe that you are in a really exciting time with them because uh, we've got the Great Commission where Jesus says, go therefore and make, you know, make disciples of all nations. 
But then what he says, the second part of this, he says, he says to teach them all that I have commanded. And so there's this kind of second part of the Great Commission that we are to teach these people that have come to know Jesus, we're to, we're to teach them all about God. Um, and there, you know, there's many ways that the scripture just lays out um, for us to, uh, to take a new disciple and just the, the things that are essential for, uh, for, for new disciples to, to grow in their faith. But I want to just really focus on two um, that I think are essential right in the beginning. And, and they are the word of God. So getting them immersed in the word of God and then getting them immersed with the people of God. Um, and so the word of God we need to get them to actually start learning that these are God's words and that he wants to use his words to change people's lives. So he's, go, he's going to, to, to use, you know, from, from all the way from Genesis to Revelation to communicate more about himself and to help these disciples learn what it means to follow him, but then what it means to know him and then what it means to make disciples. So I would encourage, you know, I would encourage you with a, with a new disciple um, just a specific thing in getting the word. I would say, man, commit, ask them to commit with you for a few weeks, maybe even a few months, that they will read a book of the Bible with you. Um, I would pick maybe like, the, like one of the epistles or maybe even one of the gospels, um, get an ESV study guide, or even get like a Jen Wilkin Bible study or something like that, and just get in the word and just have them commit every week or every other week or something like that, that they will get in the word with you and that you can just help teach them as you go through this study, teach them how to start self-feeding on the Word, that you're just not, again, teaching, that you're teaching them really how to hear from God Himself. Um, they do need to, to learn to know um, how, to, how to do the Word. So that is the Word of God. The second essential, I would say, is get them immersed into the people of God. I love this, but when, you know, when Jesus you know, uh, takes, a, you know, takes someone from death to life, I love this, He brings them into a new family. They're not, you know, by themselves, they're not just part of their blood family, but they are a part of a new family, a new identity, and that family is the church. The global church, but also very specifically, global churches, the global church is made up of local churches. So you want to help your disciple, you want to get them connected and immersed, not just connected, but immersed into the fabric of um, the life of the church and the people of God. Um, so I think that means getting them um, connected to your campus, into a baptism membership class where they're getting to, to hear you know, things about the church, hear things about you know, the essentials of walking with Jesus. They're, they're learning what baptism means, these kinds of things. And they're really uh, c committing, not just committing, they're covenanting with this, you know, with this local campus or with, your, with, with their local campus. So um, get them in membership. Um, another thing is just like even helping them start to see like, hey, jump in, you know, to this small group. Like if you're probably, you're a part of a small group, so you want to get them immersed into your small group. If it's not, you know, your small group's full, get them connected to group link where they can get involved in, you know, one of the other small groups that are part of their campus and then help them to start learning to serve uh, and jumping in with other people, linking arms with other people and serving alongside of the local body. Um, and I believe that the Word of God and the people of God, your disciple, your friend, ultimately Jesus' work will work through the Word of God and the people of God to help, your, um, to help your one become more and more of a mature, joyful disciple of Christ. Well, thanks again for joining us for Who's Your One Evangelism Training. Now remember, if you blatantly ignored what I said at the beginning, and I know there's always at least one of you out there who does, I want you to go ahead and let us know that you were here. Get credit for being here. Go to summitchurch.com slash one and register. I promise you, it will be the easiest thing that you do today. Okay, all right, so you might be asking, well, what's next? Well, for those of you who are watching this in your small group, or if you've joined us at one of our campus locations, we've got a discussion guide that you can use to close out our time here together with each other. If you're joining us online or you're by yourself, we've got additional resources at summitchurch.com slash one. Now, you get a pass for, for, for now, but you really ought to get yourself into a small group. I mean, Jesus was in a small group, all right? I'm just saying, we had his like, you know, 12, so it's not too good for you. We, the leaders of the Summit Church, we're praying that in the coming months, God would move in our hearts and in the hearts of our ones. You see, we know that God is, is still doing more than we can even ask or ever imagine here in our church and in our community. So let's believe Him for the fullness of that this year.